One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Let us pray. O eternal, almighty, and most gracious God, heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. Holy and reverent is your name. You are praised by the heavenly host and the, by the congregation of the saints here on the earth, and you will be sanctified in all that is to come. We are sinful and unworthy, but being invited by you are bold through our blessed mediator to present ourselves and our supplications before you. Receive us graciously. Help us by thy spirit. Let thy fear be upon us. Let thy word come to us in power and be received in love with attentive reverent and obedient minds. Make it to us a savior of our lives. Cause us to be fervent in prayer and joyful in our praises and to serve you this day without distraction that we may find that a day in your courts is better than a thousand and that it is good for us to draw near to you, God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. If you would now please stand as we worship in song. Now this first song, as I've told you before, comes, come praise and glorify, comes from Ephesians, the first chapter of Ephesians. And the third verse, it talks about how we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so I just wanted to read that verse from you in Ephesians 1.13, where it says, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for placing your seal on us to identify us as your children and to protect us from the wrath to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>
may be seated for this last song. saying this uh, before the, th the throne of God above and I just wanted to take a moment um, as we close you know our first uh, portion of singing and, and really enter into a little bit of time of prayer uh, these words especially in the verse verse just struck me as we're sitting there um, so if you would just bow your head and pray with me uh, dear Heavenly Father we're just reminded uh, by these beautiful words that we tr you truly are our one and only plea uh, the only defense we have is in your son Jesus. Uh, we come before you uh, broken, guilty, uh, burdened by the, the sin that we carry day in and day out, and uh, it is just a great reminder that uh, your son lives and pleads for us, even as we stand here now, 
uh, mediates uh, between us and you uh, currently. Our names are truly written on his hands, on his heart, and that while he lives, we have eternal life with you. Uh, bless our time, Lord. May we truly be blessed by these words. Amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, today. Uh, just a reminder, a week from Wednesday, we will be having our congregational meeting. Uh, so the letters were just sent out here this past week, so you should be getting a letter uh, regarding that uh, early uh, this week. Um, this is not a formal business meeting, so it's open to anyone. Okay, it, it, it's, and uh, there's, there's more going to come out. Uh, but it's really just going to be a time of prayer, a uh, time of uh, reflecting on uh, the good and the bad that's happened over the last year and a half, a uh, time of, of repentance, uh, and uh, hopefully we, we come together seeking God, seeking the, the healing that we can only find through Him, uh, and then as we start really on a journey of discovering uh, what God has for us here. Um, so I uh, encourage you to uh, make time to come out. Uh, it should be a, a good time together. Um, and also, I, as I mentioned last week, I'm going to be picking up on uh, Wednesday evening services. Uh, if you have time, come on out to that. Uh, we're really going to be taking some time in looking at um, different ways to pray and, and the impact that prayer can have on our lives. Uh, so I hope that, uh, you know, if you have time, come on out. I know, I know midweek is busy. Uh, trust me. Uh, we've got kids at home, and the schedule fills up quick. But uh, it is a, a time of um, really a good time of refreshing. Are there any other announcements this morning? Rick. If you weren't here last week, Rick lost. Someone picked up Rick's umbrella. It grew legs. So if you have it, please, please return it. <laughs> or pray for no rain until Rick gets his umbrella back. Any other announcements? All right, then, if you would, please turn in your blue hymnal uh, to hymn number 48 and stand as we sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy.
and you may be seated. All right, in the way of prayer concerns this morning, who would have who would have an unspoken request? Others. Bro. Uh, Don and Marge Heidi. Marjorie's had diarrhea for three weeks and she's just starting to get on the meds. But Don last week had a heart attack and got rushed to an emergency room and they performed surgery and they all they had to do was put a couple of stents in to get him get him going again. So he's on the meds. Or Tammy, sorry. Had shoulder surgery, right? Okay. Will had shoulder surgery. Bill had surgery to put. They're inserting a stem in his back. Yes. Yeah. And so he had part one, I think, a couple weeks ago, right? Uh, and Gary, uh, I just got a report yesterday. Actually, my my daughter was on Gary's wing yesterday. Um, he's scheduled to be discharged in a couple weeks, making progress. So keep keep praying for for Gary. Any other requests? Jeannie G., she's having shoulder surgery tomorrow. All right, if there's no others, then let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as always, it is a great joy to come before you this morning. Uh, it is a joy to be uh, called out of the world, um, to be called together as your people here at Newman, uh, to have the great opportunity to gather freely week in and week out, to uh, worship your name, to lift up praises to you, uh, and to uh, lift up our concerns to you. Uh, we know you are always attentive to, uh, to our needs, and so in that vein, we, we lift up our concerns before you this morning. Uh, knowing that you will uh, answer our prayers. Uh, we uh, lift up uh, Don and Mary, who are both going through, uh, Don and Marjorie, I'm sorry, who are, who are both going through some health issues, and we just pray that you would uh, be with them and, and encourage them as they heal. Uh, we also think of Denise, who's having shoulder surgery uh, shortly, and uh, pray that uh, that would go well. I pray that you would be with her as she uh, recovers. Uh, we also think of Nina, who has suffered a brain aneurysm, and uh, 
I just pray that uh, there would be, uh, wouldn't be much damage, that she would uh, be able to recover and, and, and get back to a normalcy. Uh, we think of Rebecca and pray that uh, she's able to get over to C. diff uh, uh, fairly soon. Uh, we know it can be extremely painful and difficult, and uh, we just ask that you would uh, be with her uh, during this time. Uh, we think of Colin, who is uh, back in the hospital, um, and we pray that especially at this difficult time that uh, you would just encourage him by your spirit, uh, that he would uh, sense your presence, that he would uh, seek you uh, in his time of need, uh, that he would feel encouraged. Uh, we do ask that you would uh, heal his body, uh, that, the, that we ask for a miracle. We know that you are the great surgeon, and uh, really you're the only one who can, who can heal him at this time, and we, so we ask that you would do that. Uh, but in the meantime, we lift up all those who are caring for him, and we lift up the family and ask that they would be comforted. Um, we think of Brian, who is struggling with some mental health issues right now. Uh, we know that uh, you know, mental health is a, is a thing that has, has, has gotten a lot of, um, I think, public publicity, and, and there's so many more resources available to us now today. And that is a wonderful thing, and we ask that you would uh, put some uh, people in Brian's path that would be able to help him, uh, that he would uh, seek help uh, outside of himself, and that he would be able to find that, uh, find the help that he needs so that he could, um, so that he could really have some wholeness uh, again. Uh, we're always thankful um, for uh, positive reports, and, and we, you know, at this time lift up uh, Wilda and Bill and Gary and pray that you would be with them during their, their healing. We ask, as always, that uh, they would be able to uh, recover and have uh, full use of their uh, body, their faculties, that they would be encouraged um, by the progress that they've made so far, but uh, hopeful for, for what is yet to, to come. Uh, Lord, we, are, we find ourselves, you know, during this time of the year, really in the dog days of summer, and um, it's um, amazing to know that uh, this year is, is well over half over. Uh, seems that time just flies. Uh, so we ask that we, during uh, the busyness of our lives and the ever moving forward schedule, that uh, you would allow us to just pause during these moments as we gather together, uh, that we would be able to take a deep breath and, and put behind us the cares that we brought in here with us from this past week, that we would uh, be able to uh, pause on the anxiety and on the the thing, the list of things that need to get done in the upcoming week, uh, that we'll be able to just be in this moment, uh, that we'll be able to be as we sit under your care, uh, that we'll be able to uh, rest as we reflect on you, on your word. Uh, we pray that as we open your word and, and read it together, that it would encourage us and, and challenge us. Um, Week in and week out, I am just amazed at how you used uh, those early disciples at the founding of the Christian church. Uh, I pray that it would encourage us and that it would spawn us on to, to movement and action in our own lives. Uh, bless this time as we open your word. Bless uh, its reading. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for your mercy, your grace, uh, and pray that it truly would uh, be the thing that carries us throughout each and every moment of our days. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you in here have ever, I know some of you probably have, but recently gone shopping for a new car? It's so not really a fun experience, is it? Uh, maybe, you know, with the internet, we tend to do some pre-shopping, get an idea of what we might want. Uh, but if you can remember how before that, you used to have to go to the lot, walk around, see what they had, talk with a salesman who, who then was on you, right, nonstop. Um, take it for a drive, and then what was the, the question? Always the pressure, right? Are you ready to make a decision? And, and sometimes, you know, you don't want to be rude. You kind of throw out the line, well, I just need a little time to think about it. And the answer was pretty much no, though, at that time. Uh, 
But everything, you know, going up to that moment was to get you to make a decision. Or how about this one? Have you ever taken a discounted vacation that just had a small catch, a short, brief sales pitch about a timeshare that you can't live without? I've talked to some folks who, you know, taken advantage of those kind of deals, and they say, well, they, I really don't know if it was worth it. <laughs> Save money on the week, but to sit there in that short two-hour, five-hour uh, presentation that you're pressured then to make a decision. Everything comes to the sale, right? Everything comes to that decision. Will it be yes? Will it be no? Now, those are kind of really trivial things that we deal with in life, uh, but the yes-no decision is something that is actually applicable to our faith, applicable to the sharing, the spread of the gospel. The gospel is a message that demands a response. Will the hearer respond in faith, or will he or she reject the gospel? This is a pattern that we see throughout the New Testament. The gospel is a message that can't be ignored. It requires a response. We closed last week with the apostles once again proclaiming the gospel to the Jewish religious leaders uh, early in Acts. We're going to uh, go over a little bit of that, uh, review it. Uh, so we're going to start in verse 29. Chapter 5, verse 29. Now, if you remember, the apostles here, specifically Peter and John, preaching Jesus, they were arrested, thrown in jail, because they're going to be held and they're going to have to answer to the, to the Sanhedrin for what they've done. And overnight, a miracle happens, and they're released. And, and what are they told? The angel tells them, go into the square, go into the courtyard, and preach the words of life. So they were found there the next day preaching. Brought again before the Sanhedrin. Verse 29 says, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they being the religious leaders, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Now, remember how I said the gospel requires a response? Well, here's a response for you. Does it seem like the, those religious leaders responded in faith? In reality, it hardened them even more. If you remember, uh, some time ago we read through the book of Isaiah, and we read the prophet's words that told us that the word of God would not return void. It would accomplish its purpose. That purpose, as we see throughout scripture, is one of two things. God's word goes out, and it either softens hearts, or it'll do the opposite. It'll actually harden hearts. People who are proud, God's word will actually harden their hearts, more deeply entrench them in their sin. And that is what we see here. The Sanhedrin was so hard-hearted that not only did it reject the message of the apostles, but they sought to kill them. This is one of those moments where, you know, the reality of the, of the greatness of the situation we live in just smacks us in the face. So often, you know, we are hesitant to share Jesus with people because it's uncomfortable. but they were going to be killed. These folks faced the, the rulers, were released twice, and they kept going back. And so often we just don't want to be, you know, put out a little bit. We don't want to maybe to be feel bad. Uh, we don't want to be ridiculed maybe. But to be honest, our lives are not on the line. 
This is true hard-heartedness. They sought to kill the apostles. And something that's interesting is, historically, they had every right to kill the apostles. Think about it this way, okay? Jesus was put to death for blasphemy. That was really the thing that led to Jesus dying, being crucified. He put, the religious leader said he put himself in the place of God. That's blasphemy, and that cannot be tolerated. That's why he was killed. Now, these followers of Jesus sharing his teaching, it's becoming a problem, isn't it? We see early in Acts thousands of people coming to the faith. They, too, would be guilty of blasphemy according to Jewish law. Those rulers had every right to put them to death, to stomp out heresy in their mind. It happened once, right? Acts 2, Pentecost. Peter preaches this huge sermon. It's, and we're told 3,000 some souls are saved. Then we see them continue to teach. They're brought before the, the religious leaders and charged, commanded, don't teach in Jesus' name again. And rather than obey, they do the exact opposite. And the church flourishes. And we see the church grow to over 5,000 people. Then they're brought in and they're put in jail. Then they're miraculously set free. And they go back to doing the very same thing. One thing that's interesting in all of this also, this account... This is just kind of a side note. This account testifies to the truthfulness of the scripture. If you think about it, if people were just going to make up a story to found a new religion, would they put all the issues that come up, the problems, or would they make it just be perfectly rosy clean? Famous preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, he said, Here in this, we're shown very plainly and clearly that the gospel always produces a result. The New Testament gives us a very honest picture of the church and of the reactions to her preaching. We are not presented with a picture of universal success. This is not the late night uh, infomercials for the next um, real estate get-rich-quick scheme, right, that promises you results. Quite the reverse, he says. This is proof to me that this is a divinely inspired account, not a worked-up version of events. Of course, we always try to produce a good balance sheet. We always make out that we have good results. But the New Testament tells us bad results as well as the good. Nothing is concealed. It's the truth of God. If this were just a collection of made-up writings, we would expect all of them to be just a one big tale of victory. One big blessing of God. But one of the strange things that we see throughout the New Testament is that God blesses his people in very odd ways. Ways that go against the things we might think. And what we're going to see in today's story is that the persecution these folks went through was for their good, and they perceived it as a blessing. Now back to our, our passage for today. The apostles find themselves really in a precarious position. Um, the people want to kill them. Thankfully, there's one among them, though, who has a, a, some sound reason. Verse 34. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thetis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, 
and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is, if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Gamaliel, in this moment, speaks sound judgment. He brings some levity to really a very emotionally charged environment. If this is just a mere action of men, it's doomed to fail. However, he acknowledged, if God is behind this, you will not be able to stop it. In saying this, one thing that's not clear is, is Gamaliel really concerned about following God, or is he really concerned about the public perception? You have thousands of people in the town who are following after the apostles, and if you put them to death, can you imagine what would happen? You just made them martyrs. Now you might have an insurrection on your hands. People might take up arms. So while he speaks truth, there's also a sense in that it's, it's a little bit of self-preservation. Let's just take a deep breath, kind of reconvene, collect ourselves, and see what happens here. But as we see throughout Scripture, quite often people who are even seeking uh, self-service or you know, seeking for self-preservation can speak for God. There's a lot of directions that really this passage could go in. Don't be found fighting against God. You could ask, what ways are you fighting against God in your personal life? How are you putting your personal desires ahead of what God wants to do in and through you? You could also ask, what ways is the church fighting against God? We tend to elevate small things, don't we? We've, heard of, we've all heard of church splits over the color of the carpet or, or the, you know, what color the, the new windows are or did we order the right hymnals that everyone likes. Little things tend to divide us. And in doing that, you can make a very good point that we do fight against God so often. These are all, I think, legitimate applications, but I think they're a little bit shallow and they miss the point. What we see in this account is that the gospel takes center stage. The thing that won't be prevented from going forward is the good news of Jesus Christ. That is evident, especially in the next couple verses. Pick it up in verse 40. And they agreed with him, they being the rest of the Sanhedrin. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Again, these men have been arrested, warned not to preach Jesus, arrested again, miraculously released from jail. Now they've been beaten. The reality is, when it says they've been beaten, most likely what's happened is they were flogged. That means 39 lashes with a leather whip. 39 lashes with a leather whip. And what is their response? With their backs and chests probably bloodied from the flogging, we would expect them to find a safe place to rest and recover. But what we see is exactly the, obvious, or the opposite. They publicly rejoice. And they actually thank God for being beaten. And that's something that just goes completely against our intuition, against what we would think is the right thing to do. They thank God for being worthy to suffer, to be suffered as Christ had suffered. They knew intimately that the world rejected him, they're going to reject you too. One of the negative things that has happened, I think especially in, in this country over the last year and a half, is that we've 
been trained first and foremost to think of our personal safety as the most important thing we could have. Now, we're not supposed to go be foolish, right? Put our lives in danger. But as a population, we have been trained to look at each other first and foremost as threats. Intimacy between people, relationships has suffered. And as a result, we have a people who just in general are more and more selfish. Some people have come to refer to this idea as quote unquote safism. The idea that you have a right to be safe. The idea that you have a right to live a long, healthy life free of pain. This is an idea that's really a new one. It didn't exist historically. How do we reconcile this with the attitude of those first Christians? Today, we would look at people like them and say, their actions put their family in danger. How could they do that? They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer. Not only did the threats of the Sanhedrin not deter them, but it actually emboldened them. A commentator and uh, professor, Grant Osborne, wrote this. He said, they not only disobeyed the command to be silent, but they made witnessing virtually their full-time job. Luke says they spoke out day after day and went everywhere, not just in the temple, but also house to house. Moreover, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the gospel. I have to admit, that's not my perspective, right? I wake up every day, and the first thing I don't think about is who am I going to go share the gospel with today? Usually it's how many times did I hit snooze, how late am I running, and where's my coffee? That's my day. And yours might not be the same, but it's probably similar, right? We get up, and what do we have today? And if we're not too hurried, we might have time for some devotions or some prayer time in the morning. But none of us are laser-focused on the gospel. And that's unfortunately a negative of living in such a prosperous country. We've been blessed by God but we're all guilty of letting that blessing cloud our vision. According to the organization Open Doors USA, they say Christian persecution is one of the biggest human rights facing the earth today. It's not something you'll find on a list in the New York Times or Newsweek. When you talk about human rights issues around the world, they would not say Christian persecution should be on that list. This is from their website. They say, a woman in India watches as her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationalists. She doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in in a North Korea prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious. The beatings begin again. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She escaped from Boko Haram, who kidnapped her. She is pregnant, and when she returns home, her community will reject her and her baby. A group of children are laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sanctuary after eating together. Instantly, many of them are killed by a bomb blast. It was Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. These people don't live in the same region or even in the same continent, but they share an important characteristic. They were all Christians, and they all suffered because of their faith. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as any hostility experienced as a result of identifying with Jesus Christ. From the Sudan to Russia, from Nigeria to North Korea, from Colombia to India, followers of Jesus are targeted for their faith. They are attacked, They are discriminated against at work and at school. They risk sexual sexual violence, torture, arrest, and much, much more. 
In just the last year, there have been over 340 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith. 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. 4,277 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. And the hard thing to say in light of our passage today is God has counted them worthy to suffer in his name. And in that moment, our, our perspective is challenged, isn't it? We look at the beautiful life we have here and consider it a blessing, which it is. But how much are we missing out because we're not being called to suffer? We're not being called to give an account of who it is we devote our lives to at risk of our own lives. We've allowed the cares and issues of the world to distract us from our mission. The reality is our enemy is smart, he's wily, he's cunning, but he is fighting against God. And as Gamaliel noted, if this is of God, it cannot be stopped. There's a popular sentiment today that it's our job to look around and see what God is up to in the world and then go join him in that work. This is a well-intentioned thought, but it's very poor. Because who are we to know what God is actually doing in the world around us? One thing we can know is that the mission he has for us is the same mission he gave those first Christians. That mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. God saves people by the power of the gospel. Those people become witnesses of his power and might. They share the gospel with others who are then converted and so on and so on. It's what we see in the New Testament, in the beginning of Acts. They didn't have a crazy marketing plan. They didn't go make a demographic study so we could know the, you know, the ages uh, the professions of the people who live in our neighborhood. Uh, they're not putting together fancy flyers that might, you know, touch on the felt needs that people might have. They just went at people. And they spoke truth. And speaking truth in times like this takes courage. The kind of courage that we're called to exhibit Famous Baptist pastor Charles Spurgeon had this to say. He said, certain plants are so full of vitality that if you only take a fragment of a leaf and place it in the soil, the leaf will take root and grow. It is utterly impossible that such vegetation should become extinct. Think hostas, right? You can't kill hostas. They just take over. And so it is with the truth of God. It is living and incorruptible, and therefore there is no destroying it. As long as one Bible remains, the religion of free grace will live. More of that, if they could burn all the printed scriptures, as long as there remained a child who remembered a single text of the word, the truth would rise again. Even in the ashes of truth, the fire is still living. And when the breath of the Lord blows on it, the flame will burst forth gloriously. Because of this, let us be comforted in this day of blasphemy and rebuke. Comforted because though grass withers and the flower falls off, the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that has been shared with us. This is the word that we are called to share with others. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are sovereign over all the earth. You are the Holy One that we owe all allegiance to. I pray that we would see our mission as that of, of the early disciples, the spread of the gospel. Help us to overcome our fears. Help us to overcome our doubts. Help us to praise you in the midst of our troubles so that those around us would hear that you are the God who saves, that you are the God who is faithful. Be with us this day, Lord. We ask in your son's name. Amen. would
please take out your blue hymnal and turn to hymn number 354 and stand as we sing together, The Church is One Foundation. leave you with these words from the book of 1 Peter. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.